Before we set out, we would like to outline some of our course objectives. First, we're going to start by taking a look at GISD's learner profile and how this training fits into that. Next, we'll take a look at John Spencer and discuss his theory of critical consumption. Then we'll take a dive into Google Earth as well as Google Arts and Culture. The learner profile drives everything that we do in Georgetown Independent School District. These six elements are what comprise the Georgetown ISD learner profile. We are going to focus on these three. Students being able to communicate, collaborate, and apply critical thinking. Students are going to create and innovate, and students will obtain knowledge through inquiry and exploration. This TED Talk by Neil Harbison outlines many of the ideals that we are trying to incorporate into this thinking. Well, I was born with a, with a rare visual condition called achromatopsia, which is total color blindness. So I've never seen color, and I don't know what color looks like, because I come from a grayscale world. But since the age of 21, instead of seeing color, I can hear color. Uh, in 2003, I started a project with computer scientist Adam Montandon, and the result, with further collaborations with Peter Keshe from Slovenia and Matthias Lizana from Barcelona, is this uh, electronic eye. It's a color sensor that detects the color frequency in front of me and sends this frequency to a chip installed at the back of my head, and I hear the color in front of me through the bone, through bone conduction. So, for example, if I have, if I have like... This is the sound of purple. For example, this is the sound of grass. This is red, like dead. This is the sound of a dirty sock, like, which is like yellow, this one. So at the same time, all this information became a perception. I didn't have to think about the notes. And after some time, this perception became a feeling. I started to have favorite colors, and I started to dream in color. So uh, when I started to dream in color is when I felt that the software and my brain had united. Cause, so life has changed dramatically since I hear color, because color is almost everywhere. So biggest changes, for example, is uh, going to an art gallery. Uh, I can listen to a Picasso, for example. So it's like a, going to a concert hall, because I can listen to the paintings. And supermarkets, I find this is very shocking, very, very attractive to walk along a supermarket. It's like going to a nightclub. It's full of different <laughs> melodies. Yeah. Especially the aisle with cleaning products. It's just fabulous. Also, the way I perceive beauty has changed, because um, when I look at someone, I hear their face. So someone might look very beautiful, but sound terrible. And it might happen the opposite, the other way around. So I really enjoy creating like sound portraits of people. Instead of drawing someone's uh, face, like drawing the shape, I point at them with the eye, and I write down the different notes I hear. And then I create sound portraits. I got to a point when I was able to perceive 360 colors, just like human vision. I was able to differentiate all the degrees of the color wheel. But then I just thought that this human vision was, wasn't good enough. It, there's many, many more colors around us that we cannot perceive, but that electronic eyes can perceive. So I decided to continue extending my color senses, and I added uh, infrared and I added ultraviolet to the color-to-sound scale. So now I can hear colors that the human eye cannot perceive. For example, uh, perceiving infrared is good because you can actually detect if there's movement detectors in a room. I can hear if someone points at me with a remote control. And uh, the good thing about perceiving ultraviolet is that you can hear if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe. Because ultraviolet is a dangerous color, a color that can actually kill us. So I think we should all have this wish to perceive things that we, we cannot perceive. We should all think that knowledge comes from our senses. So if we extend our senses, we will consequently extend our knowledge. I think life will be much more exciting when we stop creating applications for mobile phones and we start creating applications for our own body. 
think this will be a, a big, big change that we'll see during this century. So I do encourage you all to think about which senses you'd like to extend. I would encourage you to become a cyborg. You won't be alone. Thank you. <laughs> now that you've watched the video from Neil Harbison, you can see the power of creativity. Another person we want to mention is Dr. John Spencer. Uh, Dr. Spencer is a former middle school teacher and current college professor. He wants to see teachers unleash the creative potential in all of their students so that kids can become makers, designers, artists, and engineers. He explores research, interviews educators, deconstructs systems, and studies real-world examples of design thinking in action. He has written many books, uh, two of which have really inspired me in my teaching career. One of them is titled Empower, What Happens When Students Own Their Learning? And the other one is Launch, Using Thinking to Boost Creativity and Bring Out the Maker in Every Student. One thing that I found really powerful in some of Dr. Spencer's work is his thinking around the idea of students being critical consumers and that when they're a critical consumer, this can lead to their creativity. And so in his work, he has developed this cycle or this model. And in this model, there are three important pieces. The first piece being the critical consuming piece where Dr. Spencer says that consuming isn't always bad. In fact, it helps us to dive deeper into things we are already passionate about. But what we have to do is switch our students from just being passive consumers into becoming more of a critical consumer. And when they are a critical consumer, where they are curating the things that they are learning and looking at it in a deeper level, this leads to inspiration. So a good um, way to think about this is if you think about a great chef, well, a chef is going to be inspired by consuming information from, from or about new ideas in culinary arts. And through this critical consumption, that leads inspiration for the chef, which in turn leads to the creative work. So that critical consumption plus inspiration equals creativity. And then once you have done that creative work, it, it empowers you and the cycle just starts again. So if you want to learn more about John Spencer and his work around this idea of critical consuming, you can click on this icon here and it will um, take you to his blog post called The Surprising Truth Behind Creating and Consuming. And in our session today, we would like to challenge you to think about this information from this kind of viewpoint as to how we can take the information presented through tools like Google Earth and Google Arts and Cultures to um, turn our kids into critical consumers that ultimately leads to them being creators. All right, so the first tool that we're going to highlight today in our session is Google Earth. Uh, Google Earth is a very powerful tool and we are only going to kind of touch the tip of the iceberg today and hopefully um, spark some inspiration with you uh, to use it with your students. So the first thing that I want to talk about is um, how Google Earth can tra be transformed from a consumption tool into more of a creative tool. So in the past, Google Earth is and has been probably mainly used as a consumption tool. It is great for visuals. It's great for facts and information. It's fun to zoom around to different locations. But how can we kind of move from this consuming idea into more of an active, creative um, idea? 
So remember in the previous uh, slide, I discussed a little bit about Dr. Spencer and his idea of moving from being a critical consumer to becoming a creator. So if we apply this to Google Earth, then as a creation tool, we can see that there are lots of different things um, that you can do with it. And we are gonna talk a little bit more um, about some of these things uh, today in this session. So we're going to be moving from a more passive use of Google Earth to a more active use of Google Earth. So let's dive into some of the many applications in Google Earth. Remember, these are just a few of the many tools that you can find on this website. The first one that we're going to look at are the live webcams. Google Earth has partnered with explore.org to have several live webcams set up around the globe where students can watch different wildlife. They can view the wildlife interacting in their natural habitat and sit and learn many, many things just watching these different animals uh, interact in their environment. Um, each of these little pictures is linked directly to that section of Google Earth. If you want a shortcut, um, you can click on one of these pictures and it will take you directly to that live webcam section of Google Earth where you can explore some of these many animals in their natural habitats. The next feature that I want to talk about are the time lapse feature of Google Earth. Google Earth has set up many different satellite images and has put them together to create time lapse to show some of the effects of things like climate change and other uh, human effects on our planet. So we're going to watch a very short video just kind of introducing the time lapse feature in Google Earth. There's a place in our universe, a marble spinning in a vacuum. It contains life. It contains us. It may look solid and enduring, but now we can see it differently across time, living and breathing across time. We can see that we, all of us, are changing this place faster than ever before. We can see the impact of the way we live. Of the choices we make. And see their consequences. There's a place in our universe. How we decide to treat it today will determine our future. What will you think? What will you do when you see our world changing before your own eyes? A 
third application that we're going to look at are the games and quizzes in Google Earth. Uh, one of the really fun games is the where in Google Earth is Carmen San Diego. Um, such a fun game for our students to play and use the clues that are given within the game to learn more and explore different places around the planet. The other um, fun section in the games area are the quizzes where students can take different quizzes on different concepts around the world. They can take um, quizzes about landforms or animals or ecosystems. And as they take the quiz, Google Earth will um, directly zoom them to that location so that they can see some of the things that they are learning about. A fourth tool that I want to highlight is the measuring tool. So Google Earth has a great measuring tool that students can use to calculate distance, length, perimeter, whole variety of things. Uh, this video here is a short video that kind of demonstrates um, how to use the measuring tool within Google Earth. And a fifth application that I'm throwing in as a bonus, um, this is not an application that is directly linked through Google Earth, but I found it as I was putting together um, this portion of the presentation and I just couldn't resist. Um, this is a live cam from the International Space Station. So if you click on um, this link, it will take you directly there and your students can view uh, live coverage of um, the International Space Station satellite. Uh, one thing I do want to point out about the live cam features, and this affects both the animal live cams as well as the International Space Station live cam. Uh, the live cams, I believe, are on like a 24-hour um, recording. So every 24 hours, it just records over itself. And so what's nice about that is if you go on to a live cam view and you're not really seeing much action happening at that moment, um, you can click and drag the little dot at the bottom of the screen and go back in time and look at the thumbnails. And if you see something you like, you can stop it there and you can see previously recorded um, live cam uh, action uh, from that past day. So I wanted to make sure I pointed that out to you. Let's look at some ways that you can use Google Earth in your classroom. One of my favorite features of Google Earth is the projects tool. When you use projects, you can create customized maps and stories about places around the world using text, photos, and videos. Students can collaborate to make a collaborative project that they can share in addition to making an individual project. Another neat thing about projects is that it will save the final presentation to the student's Google Drive. So let's take a moment to watch this video for an intro on how to use projects in Google Earth. In this video, we're going to talk about how to create your first story or map in Google Earth. We'll show you how to save places, photos, and information all in one project so you can create a map to preserve your memories or tell a story about a journey. See where your imagination takes you. To start creating, click on Projects. Click New Project. Click the pencil icon to give your project a title and description. You'll notice that your edits are automatically saved as you work. You can start by searching for a place you'd like to add. When you've found a place you like, click the Add to Project button. Save that place to your project. You'll see the place appear in the list of features in your project. Let's add one more place. In addition to searching for places by name, you can drop a placemark directly on the globe with the creation toolbar. Select the Add Placemark button and click on the globe to add the placemark. Give your place a name and this time, let's click Edit to add more information. Here in the Property Editor, you can add rich information to your places, such as videos and images, text, styled placemarks, and more. You can even add an amazing 3D view to your place by tilting the map and clicking Capture This View. You can continue adding places to your project, including lines, shapes, and street view. 
You can share your project with a friend by clicking the Share Project button. To see your finished project, click Present. Use the previous and next buttons in the table of contents to journey through your project. Congratulations! Now you're ready to create your first project in Google Earth. Now that you've had an introduction on how to use projects inside of Google Earth, there are many different ways that you can incorporate these projects into different content areas. So let's take a deep dive and look at some of those ideas. So within a humanities department of reading and social studies, you could use projects to have students uh, trace timelines for a biography or create a timeline showing specific events that happened at a historical time or retrace an explorer's route. Uh, for literature and writing, students can use projects to recreate places that a character visited in a book or a fictional story that a student has written. For geography, they can create a project that travels to various continents around the world. In science, students can create projects to tour different landforms or ecosystems around the world. They can look at migration patterns or create a project showing different extremes of the earth, such as hottest locations, coldest locations. In math, students can create projects that show distance between different locations or show different geometric shapes of various buildings or architectural structures around the world. So there's endless possibilities for some of the different projects your students can create. Let's take a deep dive and look at two other things that you can do within Google Earth, and that is scavenger hunts and street view. Scavenger hunts are great activities for students to practice latitude and longitude coordinates. It helps them to inquire about new places, and if they get familiar with how to use scavenger hunts, they can create their own scavenger hunts within Google Earth. If you click the map above, you will get a template that will give you a copy of a scavenger hunt that you can use with your classes. So let's take a moment to look at what that template looks like. This is a quick overview of the Google Earth scavenger hunt template. Once you have made a copy of it, if you go to slide three, it will begin the template part of this tool. So you can customize these latitude and longitude coordinates here. And when you give this template to your students, what they will do is copy and paste this into the search part of Google Earth. And then they will do a couple things such as explain what they see at that coordinate, and what location they are at, and then they will paste a picture of their screen over here. The nice thing about this template is that it is totally customizable, so you can have your students visit specific locations in your community or around the world. The second tool I wanna to take a deep dive at looking at is Street View. So many of us are familiar with Street View when we use Google Maps, but Street View is also available in Google Earth. And if you click the little icon above, you can watch a video I created on how to use Street View. Street View can be a powerful tool for students to get a different perspective or a more up-close perspective of different things around the world. For younger students, a fun way to use this tool would be to get street view of different buildings in your community so they can basically take a virtual tour of where they live. For older students, they can zip around the world and get street view perspective 
of different places so they can see how other people live around the world. So now that we've talked about some of the tools and applications within Google Earth, let's see how this all connects back to our GISD learner profile. So the first learner profile trait that I want to uh, focus on is what I like to call the C to the third power or communicates, collaborates, and critical thinking. And two applications that I think uh, support this are collaborative projects and time lapse. Collaborative projects are when a group or small groups of students work together to create tours or stories within Google Earth. And there is a short video here that you can watch that walks you through how to use this feature with your students in your classroom. Time lapse, I think, is a great tool to use for students to get into some good uh, discussions and critical thinking about how our planet has changed over the years and the different impacts we have had on our planet. I feel like involving students in discussions or Socratic seminars promotes communication as well as critical thinking. If you click on this image of the time lapse in Google Earth, you can watch a short video I have created on how to use the time lapse feature in Google Earth. Some additional learner profile connections that we can make with Google Earth are through inquiry and exploration. And so here I have three different examples of how Google Earth can build those skills. Uh, the first one I want to point out over on the left is a picture of how we incorporated the live cam within the library. So you can see there that we have the live cam of the bald eagle pulled up and then next to it we just added a simple I wonder board. And as students came in, they could either ask questions that we would write down on the board or they could write their own I wonder questions. The librarian had pulled various resources about bald eagles and their habitats for students to look for answers to those questions. The middle picture shows the feature of Google Earth called I'm feeling lucky. And so this feature is shown by a dice over in the menu. And a fun way to use this would be each day as a quick warm up or once a week. The teacher could uh, click this icon where it will go to a different part of the world and students can ask questions or explore more um, about what they are looking at. The third picture is the reading the ABCs resource. Uh, this is images taken from space of different landforms around the planet and these landforms kind of have the shape of the different letters of the alphabet. So again, this would be a fun way for students to ask I wonder questions and explore a little bit more about what they are looking at. I have put a link in here to the Project Zero thinking routines. These thinking routines are a great way for you to organize some uh, different ways for students to look at some of the different information. Google Arts and Culture. Google Arts and Culture allows us to have variety in our learning, where students' activities will change regularly, covering a broad range of topics, allowing them to be engaging and interactive for a wide variety of audiences. Google Arts and Culture is also relevant. The pieces are timely and address current issues as they come up. Some of the applications include daily top picks, games, daily topics, 
Museum Explorer, Street View, and 3D Exploration. While there is much, much more available on this site, these are the six elements that we chose to focus on. Google Arts and Culture allows you and your students to explore a variety of artistic and cultural pieces. If you go down to today's top picks, you'll see a variety of items that are curated daily. For example, if I click on this five facts about women in STEM, I'm going to be taken to an article that gives me a ton of information and gives me an opportunity to explore with my students this topic. Now these topics change daily and are relevant to what is going on in the world around us, as well as providing students an opportunity to dig deeper. So as they go through it, it will give them the chance to go to stories from these collections and go uh, further down that rabbit hole. One opportunity to bring thinking routines into this lesson would be to ask students how the impact of history has been affected by this approach. Google Arts and Culture also offers games for students to play. These games allow students to interact with different materials and then get a deeper understanding after they have gone through the game. So there are a variety of games that are available. When a student first clicks on it, it will take them to the game. This game, What Came First, asks students to determine which came first uh, in a series of cultural or artistic movements. Uh, based on how quickly they answer, they get points and allows them to go further into it. So we have the Laserdisc Invention or Nirvana. Once the game's over, they get points, they get awarded um, different trophies, uh, they can play again, or they can share their score. Now, after they're finished, they can now discover their timeline and they can go into more detail based on the different artworks. So this allows them to now go down further and see different pieces and go through the next steps. The Google Arts and Culture Daily Topics section gathers together a collection of artwork that falls into a similar topic. So for this example, we have Post-Impressionism, where all of the pieces of art and stories fall within the topic of Post-Impressionism. So students can click on a specific piece and see how this artist fits into that topic. Now we can go through different stories, discover different pieces from the artist or artists that are similar to that one. It allows students to see the connection between artwork and its impact on culture. A thinking routine that you could tie into this section could be to ask students to look at how different artists affected each other and how that drove the art form forward. Google Arts and Culture Museum Explorer allows students to explore virtually museums from across the globe. All they have to do is click on the museum of their choice and they are transported to a virtual tour of that museum. They can wander the halls, they can look through artwork, they can get more information, all while sitting in the comfort of their own homes or within the classroom. Asking students to connect why they think multiple pieces of artwork are stored all within the same exhibit could be a good way to get them to dive deeper into this area. Google Arts and Culture Explore with Street View allows students to be transported around the world to see what it looks like as a street view in different situations. All they have to do is click on the one that they want, and now they can actually explore different areas. This one's a graffiti wall in Buenos Aires, Argentina, allowing students to walk around and get a first person point of view glimpse at what they are seeing. Google Arts and Culture Explore in 3D allows students to look at a 3D model from their computer screen. 
All they have to do is click on whatever 3D option they are looking for. And once that loads, students can click and drag and zoom and explore locations that they might not otherwise be able to, giving them a first-hand perspective of various locations and elements of culture. Asking students to place themselves within these environments gives them an opportunity to think about what life could be in these locations. The Google Arts and Culture Learner Profile Connection focuses on inquiry and exploration. Students can dive into a piece of art or a movement and see the cultural impact quickly. Students are able to go down a rabbit hole, which equals exploration of connections. And by developing their own relationship with the art, students begin to obtain a, a deeper knowledge base. The other learner profile connection is create and innovate. Students find inspiration from what they discover and allowing them to adapt what is learned on the site, in class, and in life to a new project. And students are able to use what is learned to find unique solutions to a common problem. So now that you have learned a little bit about the different applications for both Google Earth and Google Arts and Cultures, and how they connect to the GIC Learner Profile, let's look at some of the shared capabilities of these two systems. So the first one is they both allow for exploration. Students can explore related topics to gain a deeper understanding of the world we live in. Both of these tools um, allow the a capability for teachers to assign uh, different things to Google Classroom to make things easier for your students to access. If you are a Schoology user, you can add a shareable link to assignments for your students. There is app availability, uh, so students can use some of the different AR and VR applications. And finally, both of these systems allow students and teachers to search materials to find different resources.